good morning. Welcome to Presbyterian Church of Western Springs on this the day the Lord has made. Whether you are a visitor or a regular, it's my joy to see you. And whether you're worshiping in person this morning with us here or at home or later in the week, we're thrilled to have you be touched by the Holy Spirit sometime in the next hour. So welcome to all. As I say every Sunday, don't forget to read your connections. All the good stuff is in there. The one thing I'll highlight today is that they're packing the boxes for the college care, package, or college care packages on Tuesday at the deacon meeting. So there's a call for items that um, you all put in those packages, and I'm sure those college kids live to get those boxes. So there's baskets uh, for collection downstairs. You still have some time to uh, donate to that. Today was the day that stewardship asked for your pledges to be returned. Don't worry if you haven't done that. We'll take them at any time. But just a gentle reminder that if you have not prayerfully considered what your contribution to this place can be next year, please do so as soon as possible and get them back to the office. A few quick health announcements. Today we're celebrating Kay and Tom Kelly's grandson's Jack return home in good health after a short stay in the hospital. And as well, Bruce Barnes, he took a fall and spent some days in the hospital, but he is also on the mend. Uh, if you've not heard, Mary Jo Long's service will be Thursday, November 17th at 3 p.m. here in this space. And I ask particularly, we'll ask during our prayers, but just a note that Jim McMahon will go in for surgery tomorrow evening, so please keep Jim and Mindy in your prayers. Uh, when we get to the Litany of Saints, today is All Saints Day, when we get to the Litany, they are on the back of your bulletin. So as Amy's reading the Saints, if you want to turn it over to follow along, that's where all of our saints are listed. And you might see that we've moved the communion table down in a first step towards re returning to something that's a little more traditional in communion service now that we're stepping ourselves out of the pandemic. So I'll go over the whole set up, but believe me, we have something for everyone at today's table. We have regular bread, gluten-free bread, pre-packaged elements if you're still not ready for this, both gluten-free and regular. So we should be able to make our way through communion just fine. With that said, I invite you to join me in the prayer of tra transition as printed in our bulletin. Ever-present God, you call us on a journey to a place we do not know. We are not where we started. We have not reached our destination. We are not sure where we are or who we are. This is not always a comfortable place. Be among us, we pray, and help us to stay on course. Open our hearts to your guidance so that our journey to this unknown place continues as a journey of trust. Amen. And with that said, I invite you to settle your hearts and your minds for the worship of the Lord. Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. We gather with the company of the faithful, those who know the way to the kingdom, We gather remembering the ones we call saints. Those who make compassion their day job and those who have no day named after them. We gather praising God for all who have shaped our faith. Those who showed us the dance steps of heaven and those who taught us to play the instruments of joy.
As we remember the saints today, we remember their humanity as well. Like us, they stumbled and fell, but they never hesitated to turn to God in humble admission of their need for grace and restoration. Join me in our lit litany of confession as we follow the example of the saints. Our youth offer prophecy of challenge and judgment. We nod politely, with clenched teeth, and closed eyes. Invited to dream dreams. We prefer the familiarity of the past. Winds of vision swirl around us. We close the windows and bolt the doors. Elijah heard you in the sheer silence. Help us to open our hearts to the rush of your spirit. Your saints are the young and the old. Help us to recognize the gifts of the youth and children that you share with us. Let us have ears to hear and eyes to see the wisdom they bring to our world. Hear the good news of God's love for us, not in the earthquake, not in the storms, not in the mighty deeds, but in the silence, in the gentle touch, in the quiet rain, God says again, you are my beloved. I love you. Amen. Amen. Having heard that assurance that indeed we are God's beloved and God loves us, let us share that love with each other now in the passing of the peace of Christ. Lots of love going around this morning. It's great. I invite you now, oh, you're seated. Very good. I was going to invite you to be seated for the Litany of Saints. We remember, O oh God, the countless saints of history who have blazed a trail of courage through time. We remember, O oh God, the tender touch of loved ones, the example of heroes, the healing words of comforters, the remarkable acts of fearless ones. We remember, O oh God, the gentle strength of grandmothers, the loyalty of friends, the kindness of strangers, the joy of children, the sacrifice of parents. We remember, O oh God, the blessing of the Spirit, the reminder of his words, the sharing of his suffering, the glory of his resurrection shone forth in the lives of his 
his disciples. Young and old, dead and living, articulate and silent, strange and familiar, brilliant and ordinary. We remember in every time and place the saints of God who have shown us the Lord. Today, we remember in particular Maxine Allison. George Lewis Bruiser. Jacob DeBoer. Mary Ellen Fensel. Jessica Foreman. Nancy Gower. Betty Hodge. Joe Jennings. Helene Jordan. Eleanor Marie Canick. Richard Herman Canick. Mary Jo Long. Louis Mathopoulos. Wendy Montague. Shirley Pine. Peter Wilkie. And for all those not named, but remembered in our hearts. Please be seated. Well, this morning, of course, we're still in the Old Testament. We're not jumping quite as far. We're not going dec uh, centuries, more like decades this time. And this morning, we're going to meet the great prophet Elijah. 
So here, are the story of Elijah fleeing from Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 18. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel-Maholaha, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is the word of God given for the people of God. And I'm looking for kids. And I think we'll go over here today. It's kind of crowded up here. Come on over here. I think we have some coming from upstairs. So we'll wait. How are you today? Good. How was Halloween? Good. You had a lot of candy? Mm-hmm. What's your favorite candy? I like candy. What did you say? Oh, yeah. I like okay, <laughs> so you guys are like me, yeah. Do you have a, f- a particular favorite kind of chocolate? I like Milky Ways. Hi there. We were just talking about Halloween and our favorite candy. Did you have a good Halloween? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite candy? No? No? All right. You like all candies. Okay. So today we heard a kind of crazy story about Elijah. Have you ever heard that name, Elijah? Some of these names we're hearing are very different than our names, aren't they? Because they're from different countries. So Elijah was a prophet, 
and Queen Jezebel was the queen of Israel, and she was probably the meanest queen that ever lived. She was terrible. And she got mad at Elijah. So what, how do you think Elijah felt? How would you feel if a really mean king or queen was mad at you? Mm, upset. Maybe kind of scared. So what do you think he did? He ran away. He fled, exactly. He ran away. Did you ever feel like you were scared and you wanted to run away? Yeah, me too. Me too. Or you feel like, I'm done. I just can't do this anymore. And that's how Elijah felt. And so what did he do? He took a nap. And God made sure that there was a little cake there for him when he woke up and a little drink. And then he took another nap. And what do you think was there when he woke up from the next cake and a drink? And then he felt a little better. He still complained to God. He still said, I'm kind of tired of this. But God listened. So that tells me we can tell God we're tired, or we can tell God we're scared, or we can tell God we've kind of had enough. And then God fed him, gave him some to drink, and then eventually said, okay, now it's time to go back. Got to go do the things you got to do. So sometimes when we're afraid or scared, maybe we get a little rest. Maybe somebody makes us a treat, and then we feel a little bit better, and we're ready to go back to school or back to baseball or back to dance class or whatever it is we kind of wanted to get away from. Does that make sense? Okay, so when you feel that way, think about Elijah and think about all the ways that God took care of him and know that God will take care of you too, okay? And maybe take a nap and have a snack. Always helps. All right? Should we say our prayer? Okay, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, Sunday school today, so you can all head back to Sunday school. Oh, do you have something to put in the basket? No, okay, okay, great. All right, off to Sunday school. I invite you to pray with me. Eternal God, settle our busy minds and open our hearts so that each one of us may hear what it is you have to say to us whenever it is that we receive this message. And as always, I pray that my words would be your words. Amen. So here we are already at All Saints Day. Technically, we've overshot it by a few days because it's November 1st on the church calendar. And it's where we get our term Halloween because October 31st was All Hallowed's Eve. So, and more to that, it's kind of like a trifecta holiday as well, because you had All Hallowed's Eve on the 31st of October, All Saints Day on November 1st, and then November 2nd was All Souls Day. All Saints was reserved for the celebrity saints, those folks who lived lives that ended up getting a day named after them. But the church always recognized that the rest of us are also worth remembering, that we aren't all called to martyrdom and stardom. And so All Saints, Souls Day, excuse me, was to recognize everyone else, saint and sinner alike. Now, I admit that growing up Catholic, the lives of the famous saints were fascinating. The legends were fantastical and often unbelievable. They were the stuff of movies and comic books. And when we were confirmed, we got to pick our own new name, and it had to be a saint's name. So I chose Ellen which was my grandmother's and my favorite cousin's name. So here I am, Leslie Ann Ellen Weir. When my kids were being confirmed decades later, they actually had to research the saint that they chose. And so I decided, I'm going to look up Saint Ellen. And I had a little, oh my goodness, moment. Saint Ellen, yes, that beloved saint of difficult marriages, divorced people, and converts. 
You may not know me well enough yet to know my history, but believe me, unbeknownst to me at the time that I chose it, Ellen was the perfect name for me. Difficult first marriage that eventually ended in divorce and me converting to Presbyterianism. I kid you not. Makes me wonder if there's something to all this saint stuff. But what is it that makes a saint? And are saints still being made? I can think of many modern-day famous saints. Mother Teresa and Oscar Romero come to mind, of course. But there's also Dorothy Day and Fred Rogers. Neither of them are official saints, but they certainly lived saint-like lives. And I personally would add Richard Rohr and D. Yo. Oh, you don't know D. Yo? Well, when I was a young mother first volunteering for all sorts of things at my parish, I met D. Dee was in her mid to late 50s. She smoked like a chimney. She had long orange painted fingernails, and she was filled with more joy than anyone I had ever met. She was wisecracking, funny, and also compassionate and caring. She called things like she saw them, but always with a loving touch. She was a great listener and had wisdom I treasured and hoped to one day possess. She was the assistant director of religious education at the parish, and I loved any meeting I got to go to that Dee was at. And then one day I learned some startling news about Dee. She was a widow for many, many years already. And three years after her husband had died, her oldest daughter died at the age of 13, both of them from cancer. And I remember sitting there stunned, and wondering how she survived all that the way she did. Eventually, we became friends, and so one day I asked her how and when she knew she was going to be okay to survive the awful tragedies that life had thrown at her. And she didn't think for a minute before answering me. She said, well, it was a very long time, at least three years after her daughter's death, and she found herself standing at the kitchen sink doing dishes and all of a sudden realized she was humming. And she said in that moment, she knew her heart would make it back to life eventually. And then she looked at me and she added, and you know, Leslie, the church, God, I never let go of any of that. God got me through and brought song and joy back to my heart. When I look at the saints I mentioned, those that actually wear the title and those that don't, I see Dee's story and all of them in one form or another. So what does it take to be a saint? Well, I think it takes holding on, trusting God through thick and thin, and letting yourself have those days, those times, when the presence of God in your life doesn't fix everything doesn't make it a rose garden, doesn't change the story, yet still you hold on. Many folks were shocked years ago when Mother Teresa sh shared the darkness that she often felt, the distance from God that was part of her life. And I think if even Mother Teresa had those days, then surely we are all in good company when we also feel like throwing in the towel or wondering where God is in the midst of our pain. In fact, this pain of darkness is so common in the lives of the saints that one of them named it the dark night of the soul. And that brings me to today's scripture story, one that might seem rather odd for All Saints Day, but let's take a closer look. We meet the famous prophet Elijah today. Unlike the others that we have met this fall, Elijah just drops into the history of God's chosen people. We don't get any backstory on him, no call or birth or growing up stories. When we meet him back in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, he's already a prophet. He is well known to those around him. So where are we in Israel's history? Well, we learned last week that the kingdom will split after King Solomon dies, and Elijah lives in those years after Solomon's death. There are now two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, and both end up with terrible kings. Ahab, king of the north, and his lovely bride Jezebel rule over Israel where Elijah lives. They are evil to the core and hold nothing back as they pursue their own desires and dynasty. 
Ahab is often characterized as the worst and certainly the most unfaithful king of all of Israel's time. Now Jezebel is a foreigner and has brought to the marriage the worship of foreign gods, most specifically Baal. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel is none too happy about this. As we know from scripture, our God is a jealous God. But the folks of Israel have become captivated with Baal, and they worship both God and Baal. So God calls on Elijah to call this out and to put an end to it. And Elijah has some stunning, stellar, saint-like episodes in chapters 17 and 18. During a drought, he keeps a widow, her young son, and himself from starving to death through miraculously causing a cup of flour and a tiny bit of oil to never run out. Later, when the widow's son actually does die, he brings him back to life through fervent prayer. God then calls him to go up against Ahab and the hundreds of Baal prophets in a showdown over sacrifice. Elijah is able to conjure fire for his sacrifice in an instant, after the opposing team has tried in vain to do the same for hours on end. He is on a roll. He is riding high. There seems to be no end to his miraculous power or his connection with God. Unfortunately for Baal's prophets, the competition didn't end there, and rather they are all captured and killed by Elijah. And Queen Jezebel finds out. And Queen Jezebel, who has never been too fond of Elijah, is furious, and Queen Jezebel swears a bounty on his head, and just like that, Elijah finds himself in very different circumstances. He is in trouble, his life is in extreme danger, he is scared, and so he flees. He travels all the way south to Judah, and then goes a day's journey into Judah, and he is exhausted, and he is still scared. Here he did all this amazing ministry for God, yet he finds himself out on the run, alone in the wilderness, asking himself, for what? And in a cry similar to those wandering, complaining Israelites with Moses that we met weeks ago, he begs God to just let him die then and there. It is his own dark night of the soul. Eventually he falls into a deep sleep of exhaustion, but... God has other plans for Elijah. God is not yet done with Elijah. And once again, God provides. God sends this angel who twice shakes him awake, gives him something to eat and drink, and then sends him on his way. And he walks for 40 days and nights. Does that sound familiar at all? Until he arrives at Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, Zion, it's the old stomping grounds of Moses where God and Moses chatted more than once, where the Ten Commandments were given to Moses to give to the people, that Mount Horeb. So Elijah stops for the night and sleeps in a cave. And then comes God once again, this time with a bit of incrimination. Elijah, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You belong somewhere else. And Elijah launches into his litany of pity. Look at all I've done for you, God. I have been the most zealous prophet out there, and yet here I am alone. You asked me to do all this stuff for you, and I did it, and now they're trying to kill me, and I am the only good guy left. So God thinks Elijah maybe needs a face-to-face. -face. We might call it a come-to-Jesus meeting. God instructs Elijah to go outside the cave, for God will pass by. They can have a one-on-one. -on -one. Elijah goes outside, a hurricane wind passes by. Oh, maybe it's God, like in Moses' day, but no God. Then the earth starts to quake, and after that, a fire, like in Moses' day, but still no God. And then silence, sheer silence, and there is God in the silence this time. Not where we expect, not where Elijah expects. God always surprising us. And again, God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? You do not belong here. 
And again, Elijah goes into his rant. Don't you know what I've done for you and all for what? To be on Jezebel's hit list? And I am the only good one left, the only one. I'm done, I'm throwing in the towel. God listens and then says, okay, enough. Now pull yourself together and go back to where you do belong. Back to where I still need you. And by the way, you are not the only one. There are still 7,000 in Israel who have refused Baal and follow me alone. And they need you. And I'll give you some help. A lad named Elisha is ready to take on your mantle. He's ready to learn from you and follow you. But you are not alone. Now go. And indeed, Elijah discovers a renewed sense of call in service to God. He goes down in Israel's history as the greatest prophet ever, performing more miracles than any other. And you may recall, he is the one that joins Jesus and Moses on the mountaintop when Jesus is transfigured before Peter, James, and John. So yeah, I would say Elijah is a saint for all times. For many, Elijah represents the spiritual journey. There are highs and lows, and there is usually tragedy. There is despair and a questioning of purpose. What's it all for? And there are times of deep loneliness. And it is in these times, these lowest of low places, that God usually shows up. It is in our despair that we encounter God's grace and love so profoundly. While we all love the mountaintop experiences, our lives of faith are usually shaped and formed in the valleys, in the places we cry out, I've had enough. Elijah's story lets us ask, what happens when we are no longer on the mountaintop but have fallen off the cliff? It allows us to know that God most likely will not come to us in a blazing, flashy show but in the moments of stillness and silence. Elijah's story lets us see that even the saints struggle. Even the saints lose their way at times. Even the saints need to take a nap, have a cookie, and then head back out there. But there's also a message for us as a congregation, I think. More than a few in the past week have lifted up to me how they're feeling right now. And this story really resonated with me for those people because Elijah has indeed given his all and his best for God's kingdom. And he has made an impressive and convincing show at the bonfire, triumphing over Baal's prophets in ways that got people's attention, converted more than a few back to the God of Israel. He was on top of the church world. But before too long, he's bemoaning that he is the only one left. He's the only one out there fighting the good fight. And I wonder if we don't sometimes feel that way right now as the church. Are we the last of the last? Where are all those folks that used to fill our pews and our Sunday school classrooms and our mission trips? How many times do we find ourselves lamenting that only 12 people showed up or only three kids were there, or no one is coming in to worship. And then I wonder, is God trying to whisper to us in the stillness, you are not the only ones. There are others. Look around. They are there. I find Elijah's story to be a word of hope for us in the church today, that while we may feel defeated, where is everyone, or tired, we need more help, God is saying, hang in there, you are not alone. This story tells me God still has work for us to do, that God will let us rest a bit from the pandemic, from all the staff turnover, but that God is not done with PCWS. So are there ways that we can take this present moment and rest just a bit and listen for God's whisper in the silence and then find our renewed sense of call and purpose like Elijah did? Elijah had his own bit of a back-to-Egypt moment, 
But God says, where do you think you're doing, Elijah? Where do you think you're going? Not back to Egypt, but to the work and ministry I have for you to do at your home, at your own home. And this is our home. And we are called to be saints in our own rights right here at PCWS. And from this story and the story of other saints, what I learn is that saints have all the same struggles we do. They just hang in there with God through it all. Saints, real saints, are not afraid to admit they're tired, wrung out, or having a bit of doubt after all. But they still hang in there, and they are still willing to talk to God, even if some of it is whining and ranting. And then when they've had a bit more time and God says, okay now, time to get back at it, the real saints are ready to pick up their mantles and give it all another go. And that's what I see here this morning, pews filled with saints. So don't worry if you might be experiencing some, some of what Elijah did. Just hang in with us, maybe rest a bit, have a snack, listen for God in the spaces of stillness, be there with whatever grief or anger or frustration you're feeling and know that really that's what the life of a saint is all about. So I'm going to ask you, want to be a saint with me? I know I do. Let's go. Amen. I, you're supposed to hear God in the silence, but that sounded like <laughs> the hurricane. <laughs> I invite you to join me in prayer. Holy One of days and nights, of sinners and saints, of right and left, and everything between and beyond, we are grateful for your presence that abides in every corner of our living. Indeed, you lurk quietly in the loneliest places in our hearts, keeping watch. You grieve with us in our devastations, our losses, and our fears. You journey with us in our celebrations, our defeats, and even in the monotony of our days. You delight in us and love us. May we live in that love and delight, knowing that as we sink into you, we might become more like you, 
wanting life and grace for the world and all peoples and creatures that live upon it. We pray for this world, for the places and precious people who are striving to recover from natural disasters of all sorts. We pray for peace among nations and ask you to make us instruments of that peace. We pray for those who struggle with poverty and illness and oppression every day of their lives. And we give you thanks for all of the saints in our lives, those who are living and those who are blessed memory. This morning, please hear our prayers of gratitude for little Jack Kelly's recovery and for continued healing of Bruce Barnes. We place at your heart Jim and Mindy McMahon as they prepare for Jim's surgery tomorrow. May healing come soon for him. We pray this prayer for love's sake and all God's people said, amen. Now I invite you to take a moment of time uh, to reflect on all that has been showered upon you, um, all the gifts that we have from God. This is a time to say thank you, to practice saying thank you. If you are an electronic giver, pull out your device and you could perhaps share some of your financial gifts. There are baskets at the back when you leave if you um, would prefer to put something in the basket. But whatever, we have been given so much in our lives, and so now is the time to reflect on that as we listen to our offertory.
invite you to stand and join me in our prayer of dedication and thanks. For the wondrous gift of life, we are thankful, O oh God. Your generous outpouring of grace reminds us of the fruitful life we are called to bear, as did those saints we remember today. May these gifts express our desire to share and contribute to your coming reign among us. Amen. I invite you to be seated. I always love sharing the table all on, on All Saints Day. I feel like I feel that great cloud of witnesses even stronger than um, at a normal communion service. And so we gather today with all of those saints present and those that have gone before us, those we never even knew, uh, knowing that this is Christ's table set for all who are hungry and thirsty. This is not a PCWS table or a Presbyterian table, but all are invited who feel the call to come. And so I say to you, may the God of saints and sinners be with you. Join me in glorifying our God. Let us bless our God at all times. Indeed, it is right to give you thanks and praise. The God of Abraham and Sarah, Miriam and Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Ruth, David, Elijah, Mary, Joseph, Peter, Paul, apostles, martyrs, and ordinary unknown saints. You are the God of our mothers and fathers and our children to all generations. You, everlasting one, made us all. You fashion us into one people and continue to love us even when we deny our godly heritage. Still, you call us home to you through saints dedicated to your will. Therefore, we praise you with all the people of faith from every time and place. Blessed are you, most gracious God, for the gift of your child, our brother Jesus Christ, who lived in accord with your will to the point of laying down his life for the good news he preached and passed on to us. On the night of his address, he taught us how to serve one another in love with a ritual of table fellowship enjoyed by Christians of all times and places. In union with Christ's offering with us, we try to live out that mystery of his faith daily. Spirit of the living God, make us one as we partake of these, your gifts to us, so we might be in communion with you and one another. As we break bread together, may our eyes be opened to your glory. As we lift the cup of salvation, may we be strengthened to follow your way. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast together with all the saints at God's great family reunion. Keep your church one in service to the world here and now, even as we pray for the world you love. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. It was on that fateful night that he was eventually betrayed that he first gathered with his friends around the table. And he took bread, and after blessing it and giving thanks for it, he broke it. And he said to them, this is the bread of new life, given so that all may be one. When you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And later that same evening, he took the cup and he poured it out. And he said to them, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out so that all may be one. When you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God given for the people of God. Now this morning we have this beautiful smorgasbord up here. So in our attempt to get back to a communion the way we might have known it before, we have a beautiful basket, and I thank um, Sue Eck for preparing this for us. This little basket inside the big basket is the gluten-free bread. The bigger basket has regular bread. If you prefer still the prepackaged, that's here too. The little one is gluten-free and it's marked. The big one is regular bread and they're there. And then we have cups already poured. So here's what we're envisioning. And we'll see how it goes. 
I love to entertain at home, and it's always something different every time I do it, so I kind of feel like communion's the same way. We're gathering for this meal. You're going to be invited to come forward. There are tongs. Take a piece of bread, however you want it, and then a cup and return to your seat. Um, if carrying two things back to your seat seems a little dicey, especially going up to the balcony, please feel free to take your bread and eat it here at the communion table and then take your cup and go back to your seat. Does that make sense? If you would prefer to be served in your pew, um, please just raise your hand and we'll see that an usher or an elder gets you uh, communion. So all will be fed one way or another at this beautiful All Saints table. So with that said, friends, I invite you to come and eat. We're going to serve the choir first. Family should hold back, but we're going to serve the choir first, <laughs> just so they can sing and lead us in song. Amy, the bread and cup of new life. Cheryl, the bread and cup of new life.
served? Is there anyone that besides me? Amen. Friends, if you have not partake, do so now. I invite you to join me in our prayer of thanks printed in the bulletin. Christ, you gather us at this table, together with the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. We thank you for their example of their lives of faith. We thank you for the chance to love them as you have loved us. Bless us at this table with your love and unity forever and ever. Amen. I bless you all in the name of the one who calls us all saints. Don't forget you're a saint. I send you out into this week to rest, have a cookie if you need to, but remember whose you are and who you are, and then when you feel better, get up and get going again. Amen. Wow.